Shannon, you always tell me those stories about bail. I think there might be something there for us to, to learn from. Maybe share a story? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> the, Baal, the Baal cycle uh, is, is the fight between Baal and Mot. Baal is uh, the sky god, uh, uh, one of the sons of El. In the, in the Baal cycle, um, Baal is uh, forced to reckon with Mot. Uh, Mot is, is, is the personification of death and, and death itself, right? It's, it's the word death and the god death. In order for Baal to conquer death, or conquer Mot, he has to go down to the underworld. Mm -hmm. And the only way for Baal to get to the underworld is to die, right? So similar to, you know, um, the, 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 the Greek mythology, where you couldn't go to the underworld if you weren't dead. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's how your soul got into Hades. But what he's forced to do is um, take a uh, child and kill that child um, in order to get into the underworld. So as to trick death um, and make death think that he has defeated Baal, right? Mm -hmm. But once Baal, uh, once Mot realizes that Baal has tricked him, then it's like this never ending cycle of uh, seeking revenge on mm -hmm. Baal. The idea is that Baal was supposed to die himself. But they're wrestling with that primordial fear of death, right? The death anxiety, trying to make sense of wrestling with death, right? Yeah. Why do you think they're passing that story around, you know? Some, some, some scholars have argued um, that it is a, it is a story that um, basically uh, is, is supposed to be an example for, you know, cyclical time, um, you know, uh, going in and out of seasons. You know, something like Persephone and Hades you know, where Persephone, Persephone spends the fall and, fall and winter in, in the underworld and she spends spring and, and summer uh, up uh, with her mother, Demeter, right? So it, it could have some connotations with um, the, the, um, the change of the seasons. Some can argue, I suppose, that, um, you know, it's, it uh, is a way for people to um, find some, some solace or find some, um, some peace, you know, uh, or be at peace with death. It's it's almost like death is 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 a god. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That death has a uh, physical presence, you know, in the world, um, mm -hmm. and to explain it, um, you know. You, you need to put it in some kind of story form. The ancient Canaanites, who would include, uh, you know, the Phoenicians, who would include the later, what we would call the, the, the Hebrews or the Israelites, um, would include the uh, people who spoke Ugarit, uh, Ugaritic, which is the, the uh, Amorites. All, all these people would have had some kind of um, um, understanding of this story in, in, in um, you know and it would have been you know probably told over, over generations right um, and uh, you know they would they would have been very familiar with uh, you know the, the the Baal cycle Israelite tradition it would be Yah Yahweh right Yahweh so um, you know and and, um, and of course you know uh, Yahweh uh, defeating uh, evil or Yahweh defeating, you know, um, uh, chaos or the Leviathan um, and, and the beast, you know, and things of that nature. So, you know, there there seem to be these very similar um, mythological frameworks around around uh, the, the, the figure of death or, or death itself. Yeah. The, the other thing that I want to incorporate in there is um, course that the child sacrifice 
right? Mm -hmm. Which is which is I think so important. I mean, a, a lot of people talk about this in, in terms of um, you know Baal and child sacrifice, and you know talk about the Phoenicians or, um, or the Carthaginians, mm -hmm. right? Who were who were of course related to the Phoenicians and other Canaanite groups uh, speaking Semitic languages. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, it's not just the the the, the, Can the Canaanite groups were 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 sacrificing children. It's when you incorporate the Christian message, the Christian story, right? It's that Jesus does not sacrifice another life um, in his stead, right? He willingly gives up his own life. And he still escapes the clutches of death. So Molt thinks that he, he got Christ, right? Satan thinks that he got Christ, right? But, you know, all power is in Christ's hands, is in God's mm -hmm. hands, right? And he, and he finally, once and for all, destroys Moat, right? right? Yeah. He destroys Satan, mm -hmm. right? And so, yes, I think, I think the, that myth, right, of the Baal cycle has serious, you know, uh, uh, comparisons to the, the, to the story of Christ and his victory his victory over death you know it's uh, it's only when we get to I think Christ that we that we really see you know death is conquered once and for all you know you and I talk about Rene Girard a lot Rene Girard is good to help us see that the similarity between Christianity and myth but also the breakaway mm -hmm. and it's both they have to be brought into light uh, mm -hmm. for us to see the full picture of how much Christianity has shaped the world that we're living in today here in the modern world right? and the, and the problems that we're facing. The other thing is that Christianity has a huge bank of information that, that, that's coming before it um, that, you know, Christ is able to kind of work with, right? So he, he's, he has this arsenal that he can kind of use uh, because being God, he's, he's able to see, you know, throughout history, what human beings are doing to each other, you know, and what the gods demand of human beings, what, 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 these, what, these, what these other beings uh, are demanding of, of mankind, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, or, or what, or you might say what human beings think the gods are demanding of them. Mm. Right, mm -hmm. Christ is turning that on his head, right, saying that God does not demand uh, uh, a life, you know, to be, you know, in order to be pleased, right? You know, you you, you read it in Isaiah, you know, he says, you know, uh, I don't want any more of your burnt offerings, right? I don't want, you know, I don't I don't demand uh, a sacrifice. What mm -hmm. I demand is is uh, you know, you turn away from turn away from your evil ways. Christ is a, a kind of precursor to to these to these ancient epics, right? To the ancient uh, uh, cycles like Baal, and then they're inverted. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like flipped on his head, right? Mm -hmm. Baal, you know, like Christ is not the trickster. Christ is not, uh, you know, trying to, you know, subvert, right? He has real power, right? It's not tricking death. It's I'm stamping death out. Like I am, I am, I have victory over you, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, you cannot hold me. See, all of humanity has been creating these stories, these gods that are made in our own image. And our ideologies today are kind of vestiges of those gods. And when we project the idea that if we were God, you know, and humans are making a mess of things and being vicious and disgusting to one another, if we were in charge, we'd come in with some force and stamp it out. You know, right. we'd show some might to right. make it right. Right. But God doesn't do that in the story of what Jesus embodies, right? Yeah. And that's disrupted. It's created this alternate frequency that we're living in today. Right. Where all of our big, you know, big ideas are, are, are haunted by the idea of what we've been doing you know, as Gerard says, to find peace, is that we're, we're sacrificing, like you said, with Baal, mm -hmm. children, but mm -hmm. also 
elderly and rich and poor and peasant and uh, right. disfigured and disabled and those who can't fight back to find meaning, to find order. Because, yeah. you know, we we need to vent our, our frustrations out on people. Right. And that's been a, a convenient, unfortunate reality that we don't want to face even to this day. And I think a lot of the problems that we're finding in our world today is that um, humanity has an inability to look in the mirror fully. And we know how to do it in an abstract sense. People watch movies and they're like, yeah, absolute power. Yeah, that always corrupts people. But they don't know how to look that in the mirror for their own particular issues that drive them to want to have justice in the earth, and the justice in the world. Just a little bit of force here, a little bit of violence here, a little bit of preemptive and aggression here. Yeah. And I'll make it right because these people are awful, right? Yeah. But Jesus sees the child sacrificing and all this stuff, and he doesn't say, I'm done with this, it's all bad. He's like, he subtly works from within it, mm -hmm. flips it, because mm -hmm. he's working with, he's like a painter who's working with our ridiculous, you know, blind spots and, yeah. and, and molding it in a direction that gives us a chance to freely move out of it, right? right. Without f trying to force us, because that's not gonna work. Yeah, you observe your own conscience. You know what I mean? Like you, you, uh, you know, like you say all the time, like take the beam out of your own eye, you know, recognize your own faults, right? And, and recognize that everyone falls short, right. you know, of the, of the glory of God, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, um, that, I mean, that, that's not to say that, you know, I guess that's not to say we shouldn't, um, you know, sort of, you know, I guess the, the, the Christian term would be rebuke, you know, rebuke wrong or rebuke uh, injustice, right? But it is to recognize that, um, the, the, you know, the people that, say, are enacting injustice in the world, I think maybe don't recognize, you know, their, what they're doing. You know what I mean? It's like that, that, you know, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's something that you don't hear anybody talking about in social media today or anything. But that seems to be something that would provide uh, a kind of pathway out of the of the hot, hot stove, you know, the, the boiled cauldron or whatever you want to call it, whatever metaphor you have for this moment, yeah. at least in the West, wherever we're at, where people are just, they've had it. The polarization's hot. The, the, the fear of civil war is, is alive. You know, there's all these things that people, they've just come to a point of, a, bo a tipping point, you know? But you like myths. Very much. It speaks to our nature, whether it's things that we, that are obvious and, and things that are a little bit more suppressed. Um, and kind of speaking to this, the cycle of violence, to the Girardian cycle of violence, um, particularly there's the concept of the shadow, um, laid, laid out by Carl Jung, a great psychologist, probably the greatest one of the 20th century, and he talked about something called shadow projection. So first thing, shadow, the shadow is that, that darker side of our soul that exists within us. We, it, it's that part of ourselves that we try to pretend isn't there. And we try to pretend it's sort of like the other. Um, but it's, it's there. And what Jung would say is that the more we try to pretend it isn't there and the, and the more that we don't deal with it, we will project it onto other people. And oftentimes that that projection, us, us projecting that onto someone else, can lead us to, to, um, to scapegoat someone else, especially in a collective movement. Jung gets into this anima and animus thing, right? And this idea of the masculine and feminine that we all have, all humans have this, right? In different yes. manifestations. but. But that can also speak to a culture, to a time, to an, a moment in the history where it goes out of balance, right? How does that, like, how do we bring that into something that gives us insight into why we're in the mess we're in today, where people can't get along and they can't make sense of anything and nobody can agree on everything? What do you, how does something that seems so abstract and fairy tale bring us back to where we're at? 
Well, well, something we got to remember is the, you know, what we're talking about here are what we call archetypes, right? Mm -hmm. And there, there are several, several archetypes, but probably the most significant ones are are the shadow, that mm -hmm. that kind of deep, darker side of our soul, and then there's the anima and the animus, and the anima and the animus are the are what we would kind of call the masculine and feminine, the yin and the yang mm -hmm. part of our soul, part of our psyche. And the, the and the best way to describe each one of those is the anima would be like the um, the the anima is the feminine, mm -hmm. meaning that it's the the sustainer, the intuitive, the nurturer, um, but also too, along with that, the chaos, mm -hmm. but also the moment. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have the animus, which is the masculine, which is rationality, planning the future um, and the thing is both of these have their their better side and they have their uh, darker side mm -hmm. and what we can kind of see through history is a pen is the pendulum swinging between the animus being dominant in society and the anima being dominant in, in society what we're seeing today is the pendulum swinging in the West away from the animus having been dominant toward the, the anima. The masculine, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. From, from, from the masculine, the rationality, the science, the, um, the, 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 the pre-planned. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that whole paradigm is shifting now mm -hmm. more toward the intuitive, the, the, the feeling, the connectedness. Mm -hmm. And that's because basically the 20th century was kind of getting drunk on masculine overkill, or how do you how do you, how do you see that coming in? Well, what we could really say is, in in many in many ways, it began with the with the Enlightenment. It, it kind of in it was kind of born out of the Enlightenment, out of the um, out of the Protest, out of the out of the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. In in that time period, that that that's kind of when when the pendulum swung very, very hard in the direction of, of the masculine, of, of the animus, where what we ended up seeing was a world that, that uh, a, a world that was based on objective facts and science. Mm -hmm. and, and it was based on rationality. And that ended up becoming the, the reigning paradigm of of the of the following centuries now we're kind of experiencing the or now we're experiencing the erosion of that paradigm and the pendulum is swinging the other direction swinging the direction toward the anima which which a lot of us look at that and we say well we, we look at the world around us and we say what's happening here the we, we don't we don't consider the objective anymore to be what matters we consider the subjective to be what matters like you're living your truth right, right. and 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 that and that it's about what what this that rather than the fact being objectively true what matters is what does the fact mean how does it how does it connect to you how does it make you feel mm -hmm. and that's does it bother you does it make you feel unsafe yes right and that's the pendulum swinging. It's swinging away from the. And there's and that's a natural thing to do because you yes. know the record of the 20th century, right? You got body bags, you got chemical explosions, you got people going way too hard on trying to chop up and cut and stab and order and you know imprint by force. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, sacrificial concepts of how the world should be run, you know. People don't like hearing that there's like a masculine and a feminine, right? This is the age where people are not supposed to be saying that kind of stuff. So what you're saying is kind of out of style, you know, in terms of where we're at. But that's exactly, I guess, what you would say should be happening <laughs> if we're entering into an intuitive swing away from overcalculation and quantification, right? Well, and one of the ways to think about it is that a society is a collection of people, right? And the thing is, is that you, is you, when you have a collection of people in the same way that the, the anima and the animus exist within the human mind itself. And so when you end up having a whole society, which is a collection of people, a collection of human minds, 
you end up having you end up having a collective anima or animus for that society. But getting back to to the to the twentieth to specifically kind of the height of the animus in, in the West, which I can't think of a better I can't think of better imagery for that than World War One, where you have machine guns and tanks and all kinds of, of horrendous weapons of war which were used for the first time to to, to to really mass murder people on a very large scale. That was um, that was the height of scientific achievement turned on on human society turn, turned to destroy it. But can we put a gender to that? And why is it important to talk about it in those terms, you know? I mean, not that you're talking about gender. You're talking about something, I guess, a little bit more psychological than that, right? Or... Well, one of the reasons that it's at least that it's important to think about it in terms of to associate these things with gender is that around the world universally, we talk about myths, right? Around the world universally, human beings communicate in the form of narratives and myths and stories. You have a universal image of 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 what a, of what a man or what the masculine t- is, and you also have a universal image of what the female is. And the thing, and these attributes, the attributes of the animus, which is the masculine, um, are are are, um, are are manifest in each one of these myths around the world, myths and stories. And it doesn't matter how far back you're going. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, these uh, the, these archetypes are there. Yeah, yeah. It's just interesting to see. You know, that it does seem like we we were overly um, we were trying to build a tower of Babel. You know, in the modern age, and now we're in this postmodern age where we're saying this is all useless. This is this is domination. This is oppression. You know, and it was. There was a lot of oppression in the 20th century, and that. And before that, yes. colonialism and neocolonialism, there's stuff, there's layers and layers and layers upon this. And, you know, we have this clash between kind of what, again, that cyclical, the eternal return that the story of Baal re- represents. And then this infusion of, of this Christian story, which says, no, 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 we're not always going to keep doing this whole fight over and over again. We're going to go somewhere in history. We're moving somewhere. We're going, we're going to progress and that's what is animating the left wing kind of what's so called left part of the West is that we've got to go somewhere. We can't keep going to this, you know, masculine, feminine, you know, thing. We gotta go somewhere. We gotta go to a whole new world where we can finally bring a true equality. And not just that, but now equity. We're gonna right all the wrongs, the deficits of the past are gonna be righted yeah. with surpluses into the future. Do you think there? Do you think there's a society uh, that that exists today, which is still caught up in the masculine, and thinks that they're, you know, there's a teleology still st- stuck in the masculine, right? I mean, I, I'm, you know. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Uh, China is an excellent example because China um, still operates under five-year plans, and if you and if you go back, uh, their 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 system. Their, their their ruling bureaucracy is it comes directly from the Soviet Union. The the idea that that we as people can can um can can somehow have the adequate amount of information to to plan our entire uh, to to plan our entire way of life from the top down. As so we po- can objectively measure science and economics and everything and chart out people's destiny, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. like a, like a mathematical or scientific formula, right? Yes, that's the whole basis of the the Soviet system, or it was, right? It and was, then, and then and then China, you're saying, is still trying to keep that kind of frame going into the future. And the very interesting thing is that you have this that you have this duality of the East versus the West. Mm-hmm. That that you have the West, which is moving in the um, in the direction of the feminine, mm-hmm. and you have the East, which is swinging the complete opposite direction. Yeah, that that's swinging further and further and further into dominance of the, of, of rationality and the masculine and, and science. And aren't we supposed to have a pole shift anytime soon? So it kind of nice nice uh, little coincidence there, right? Yeah, <laughs> the magnets are shifting, right? The polarity of the magnet is shifting. Because I guess traditionally the East would be more in that feminine or the anima, right? The East had been. Yeah. 
And now they're going in another direction. It's time for them to kind of take that scientific uh, theory of Marx and bring it and bring it into fruition, right? Yep. It's time to prove our our thesis, all right? And they're using, and I guess China's using our Christian in, uh, tradition of being concerned with the vulnerable, of being concerned with the 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 uh, the oppressed. Yeah, against. And they're us. using, they're hacking it against yeah, us yeah. in some sense, yeah. right? And of yeah. course, we're doing a good job of it on our own. Except, yeah, you know, so we don't own. want to make them out to be another, <laughs> yeah. you know, boogeyman. Oh yeah, they're the ones causing us to get into crazy disputes about cereal and obsession about these things that you know, while people were dying of drug overdoses, we're fighting over these nominalistic things, right? Yeah. Logos and symbols. But, but you can see that they kind of like this. They would rather this keep going for us and kind of keep pushing us. Like, yeah, 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 keep fighting yourselves. You've got a lot of. A lot of oppression amongst you. It's like throwing a dog, uh, you know, a pack of dogs, a bunch of red meat, and seeing them fight over like it. Like a trickster, <laughs> like it's like a trickster god. Yes. You know, it's, it's like the like the trickster god or the Joker or something like that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I'm just gonna create chaos because, you know, you guys are you guys are good at blowing your own selves up. You know what I mean? Like, why do yeah. you know? We'll just throw a little something in there and very little effort. Yeah, very little effort. And I think it's appropriate to even use the, these God terms in describing nations because nations, the idea of a nation is a kind of vestige from those gods that, you know, there was no distinction between religion right. and uh, culture right. and state. These are all one thing in the ancient world, yes. right? And so this idea of having, you know, China acting like a trickster yeah. using our own, you know, our Christian, you know, concern for the victim yeah. against us is, is we're seeing the battling of gods, even though they look deconstructed as nation states today. Well, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's like even like what Shane was describing earlier about like, uh, you know, the emperor, right? Like being the... Um, like God's vicar on earth. Yeah, or, or like, like vicar God's on representative earth. on yeah, earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 kind of like they're a child of, of the God. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like yes. They're the son of the That's God. That's like Caesar, right? Son of yeah. Augustus, son of God. Yeah. The, son of Ma the mandate of heaven. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, like the, 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 the heavenly mandate. You know what I mean? Like this person is appointed by God to lead. And, you know, I mean, you know, like you said that there is no difference between like the political and the, and the, and the sacred, you know, um, you know, um, it's it's all kind of like one entity. That's what the, I guess the, the ancients would have seen it as. Like, there's no there's no difference. But you know, um, I mean, yeah, I, I that, that whole that whole thing about like you know the the um, the, the the being very calculated and and, and 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 very organized and stuff like that. You know, that used to be sort of the I guess the way that you know the West was. You had two two lungs of the church. There was the east, the east, and then the west, right? Mm -hmm. And like the west kind of represented the, the rationale and the, and the and the and the precision and and, the, and law, right? It had to be about logic and, and getting things right. And whereas the east was much more mystical, uh, poetic, it, it was about aesthetics. It was about you know really trying to um, bring some kind of beauty into the world, right? And yeah, the idea of word versus image. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Like icons and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think we're we're seeing like a, like a shift. A pole you know shift. I mean? Yeah, yeah. On, like another, on another on another like, dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, a magnetic dimension. pole shift. And, yeah. and that's kind of another duality. The the animus is usually associated with the masculine is usually associated with order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the and the feminine is usually um, so the anima is associated with disorder mm -hmm. on on a societal level. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, and and that's that's in a very very structural sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the because the the animus tends to be very 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 vertical in the way that things are planned, and the the feminine tends to be more horizontal. Mm -hmm. um, so what one of the things we're seeing is, is in the east, order is reigning, in China. Yeah. Order is reigning in the West here. Um, I think most of us would say that disorder is right. it is reigning. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, the woman scorned or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can see the sacred in our government stuff. You know, Nancy Pelosi when that riot happened in the Capitol, she said, "This is our temple." You know, you've defiled our temple, and that's not a metaphor. That's literal. She may not have meant it that way, or maybe she did, but. She let on more than she may have realized about the origins of the state having its roots in the vestige of, of sacrifice. You know, Caiaphas crystallizes the heart of politics when he leads the charge to 
persecute and kill Jesus by saying, you know, you don't understand. It's better that one man die than the whole nation perish. And that's why the Capitol is a temple, because that's the place where people come together and they deliberate about how they are going to mediate sacrifice, both abroad, which, which countries are we going to, you know, create insurrection chaos or regime change? You know, which nation states, which lesser gods will we defeat because they have been, you know, run by wicked people or what have you, that's the narrative. And then here at home, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the things we're gonna mediate out for sacrifice about speech or what kind of weapon you can own or, you know, what drug you can consume, whether your milk can be heated and sold or whether it can be just, you know, can you sell it without heating it? You know, these are things that they're going to do the sacred task that you don't have the right to do as an individual. I mean, you're in the profane space. In that sense, the Capitol is a sacred space because in that moment of legislation and, and the other things that happen around D.C., they can do that which you can't, which is decree who shall be expunged, who should be expelled into the belly of the prison system, which is kind of our, our modern day hell, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a living hell to be in prison. And we're wrestling with these issues. We have people protesting around the streets in this country about abolish the priests, police, abolish the cops, abolish the prisons, you know? So we're, 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 we're wrestling with this stuff. We, at the one, one person can look at the Capitol and they say, that is a sacred place. Why is it sacred though? Because it's set apart to do that which we're not supposed to do to each other. But of course it's not sacred in the sense that it doesn't unite us anymore. It doesn't bind us together. We don't agree. There's a mob running into it. It's horrible. People are dying. People are, are losing their wits on both sides of the aisle. And one side wants to say, no, that team's the only team that does profane violence. Our team's just fine. Anybody you see hurt and our violence, anybody that does a riot and our team, it's just an imposter. And both sides say that for each other. But you see this, 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 these spasms of chaos and mob aggression boiling up, which means that the sacred isn't working. Right, and that, that, that's the you know? thing that I... It's so bubbling up. That's what, I want, I, that's what I want to ask you too, because I kind of think it's like, you know, uh, Pope Benedict talks about this, and um, the further you are from the initial event, right? Like if you talk about sacrifice, someone's death, the further you are from that, from that thing that kind of became sacred or deified, the, le the less kind of effect it has, right? The less, the less, uh, the less of a of a pharmacon it is. You know what I mean? It doesn't have the same. It doesn't have the same catharsis. Catharsis right? because the same because piece. it's so it's so it's so it's so diluted, right? Like the the human being is no longer remembered for what for what it truly is, is it, which, which is a which is a murder or, or, a, or a death, right? Now it's become like just a passing word. Like that's why you know it's like when Easter comes. We're not really focused on Jesus being like the, the slain lamb or, or the sacrifice. Now it's like, oh, you know, like here's an Easter egg with a whole bunch of candy in it. Like, you right. know, let's, right. you know, there's bunnies everywhere. So, you know what I mean? Here's some peeps. Yeah. You know what I mean? It loses and, its potency. Yeah, right? it's, it's, yeah. yeah it, it doesn't have that same effect. So what, because I think that's what's wrong with, you know, when you talk about politics, it's like that's what's, that's what's, that's what's wrong with Christianity is that, that, that effectiveness mm -hmm. of of Christ being the, the center, you know what I mean, and, and taking on, you know, um, you know the the, the being, being the sacrifice, you know, is is lost. And, and it's like, how do you how do you get that back? Like, how do you how do you have a you know? Is, is there a return to the sacred? You know what I mean? Is there something that like that can unite us together? Yeah, yeah. It, it can't. We cannot. When you look at what Rene George spelled out in history, we cannot unite around sacrifice anymore. And that's why, you know, we can't agree on who the villains are. We can't agree on who the victims are. It's this complete schismatic attempt. Every time we try to impose a narrative that says, we're good, these are good, those are bad. It creates a schism, boom, rebellion. And it creates a martyr's perch for the person that you're expelling. You are deplorable. Okay, now we've got t-shirts that say, hey, I'm a deplorable. I'm happy for that. And people who were on the sidelines of that say, I wasn't interested until you called him deplorable. Now I want to take another look. Because we're, we are in Jesus' fishbowl. We're swimming in it. 
And in, in Jesus' fishbowl, if the whole crowd says you're deplorable, they're going to say, I'm going to take a look at what's going on over there. Because we are in the story of the stone that the builders has rejected has become the cornerstone. We're in that story. And that's like, what the heck is that? That's a description that Jesus gives for his life mission. What he's bringing a new world order into reality, right? In which the idea that that which is expelled because it doesn't fit the narrative. And so therefore it has to play the role of the scapegoat, of the boogeyman, of the, of the outcast. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's become the cornerstone. The person who is rejected in a community is now the cornerstone because of that very rejection, because of that expulsion. It's the act of expulsion that makes that person have a martyr's energy, a sacred aura, and therefore from that moment can attract other people who were either involved in the scapegoating of that person or that behavior or that action or that identity or that racial group or gender because there have been these acts of oppression happening and these expulsion and hierarchies mediated on maintaining people in a state of oppression. But Jesus is scrambling that whole hierarchical order and saying, no, the new order is you're going to have to learn to get together in this new order that I'm creating in history, that I've unleashed like a tactician into history, a grand strategist more like it. And people say whether he's, you know, I don't think he's God. It's like, I think it's more of a miracle if he wasn't God then, you know? If you want to take away the claim that he wasn't, what he has unleashed like a grand strategist of saying, I'm going to expose the way you have always created community where you whitewash the victims out of the history books and you make them the villains and you, and you make the, and you, when you write the stories about them, you impute guilty admissions onto your victims. And we still try to do that today. Look at the news, you know, on both sides, you know, always trying to impute guilt onto the person that they're, the group or the political rival that they're trying to cast out as the villain in that narrative. And so we're just going to continue to fracture until we can learn, you know, what I believe is what Jesus is trying to get us to do is to see the, that the human person is where we have to ground our, our, our respect and not identity tribes, you know, that's what, I see identity tribalism as kind of a return to the old order that we were trying to stop, you know, that you don't judge people by their gender, you don't judge people because of what they look like, you know, that's the occasion for scapegoating in the past, but now we're bringing it back, you know, as if it's this, the only way we can protect victims is that if we get every, every victim to bind together in a group, that's what I've heard some people say. We can't have the luxury of individual rights until we get our group rights. You know? Do we need a balance between the the the, the anima and the and the animas? Do we I mean or is this gonna be a continuous pendulum swinging back and forth, you know, like history, you know. It will probably continue to 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 be a pendulum swinging back and forth. We'll probably continue to see to see history um uh, undulate, swing, swing in the form of cycles um, that, hit, you know, kind of working through a process. So, so do, do, do you think there's going to be, because I mean, because my thing is like, if that's the case, then then where's the tele, where's the kind of final end to that? Where's the teleology? If, if it's like we're going through some kind of these cycles all the time, is, is there, you know, do you think there's some kind of like end to that? Like, so is this history always repeat, or are we going to get somewhere? I, right? I, I, yeah, I mean, because my thing is, is like I want to see a end to that. Like mm -hmm. I want to, I want to see a, you know, some kind of like, you know, end result where there's where there's like balance or something like that between mm -hmm. harmony. Between, yeah. yeah, harmony, or you know. And that goes to what you, you talk about, because with Carl Jung, you talk about how he's about the individual, the psyche, and then you talk about, you know, where we get into Rene Girard, that's more about the anthropology and the community, the evolution of the human species and how we make society, and there's a balance that needs to happen there too, right? One and many, you know, comes yeah. together here. You know? and, 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 the, and the fact is, is that, that the two of them, Jung and Girard, both both go, go together very well. In fact, the two kind of, kind of, uh, kind of unlock each other even though you know 
some Gerard f- fans would say, no, 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 we don't have any time for psychology and what Young's doing. But I do think I do see you can look at these things on different layers and get some correlating truths, right? Right. It it, it would be it's sort like of like yeah. It would it would be sort of like looking at um at looking at something from two different points of view. Mm-hmm. What it does is it 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 enriches your understanding of, mm-hmm. of whatever that item is. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what what Young and Gerard both do yeah. for one another. Right. One one would be looking kind of like at the. You, know, you said it before, like bottom up, and one's the other way. Yes, that uh, that that Gerard is looking at is looking at everything from the top down. Is is kind of like looking at everything fr- from an eagle's point of view. And then and then Young is looking at at everything from the bottom up. Yeah. Is looking at um. As looking at the individual's mind, but but the thing is, is that really to to really understand the full picture, we've got to look, we've got to understand both. Yeah. And the irony is, is like you're talking about an eagle's point of view, which reminds me of like a god's point of view. Yeah. Because he's trying to map how did humans have religion and how do we how do we survive, right? And Gerard says that religion is the placenta. It's what kept us together because we we're so mimetic, we're so hyper mirror neuron in our aggression that. Unlike animals, where we'll ju- they'll just submit, you know, to a rival without going into genocide, we go the other way. We go mimetically into insane, violent imitation, you know, tit for tat, forever. That, and so he's like, "Well, how are we still here if that's how we do things?" And he stumbles into this pattern of the scapegoat expulsion of, of channeling all that bad blood onto a common threat or a common victim or a common uh, person who's too different that stands out from where everybody else is in that moment of reciprocal sameness right and and at the same time so he's seeing it from this god's view but then we get the trick that it turns out god's a human person a baby he starts as a baby right so now we're getting that individual to get to the god's view you know the camera of history you know that's what jesus says behold i see satan fall like lightning we thought the gods were on the side of what we were doing and all of a sudden that that camera falls like lightning and it, get, and it shows up in a barn, right, with the baby in a food trough. And you're like, oh, what's this? This is, this, you know, this is, a lot, this is a lot closer to Earth than we were expecting, you know. We don't, this is not the kind of God we were looking for, you know. And we've been expelling him ever since. You know, that, the story of uh, Jesus and Barabbas is a great example for our time, right? Yes. Because Barabbas, you know, Bar Abbas of the Father... And in the earliest text of the Gospels, it says that his, his name is Jesus Barabbas. So there's a tale of two Jesus. And Pilate's offering the crowd, who do you want to save? You can save one guy. I'll let you save one guy. You want, and people think of Barabbas as kind of like this, this Jack the Ripper fella. You know, in, in the Sunday school idea. He's just out there killing people. He's just the bloody murderer. It's like, no, he was a revolutionary. He saw the injustices of his time. He saw that his people were oppressed and raped and assaulted in different ways. And he, he wanted to do something about it by force. He wanted to enact some social justice or whatever kind of justice you want. And the crowd chose him. They said, let's save him and let's kill the guy who says, love our neighbor. Let's desire mercy, not sacrifice. Let's turn the other cheek and disable this through nonviolence and and forbearance of people's aggression. And I think we're still choosing the wrong Jesus 2,000 years later, you know. You know, but we're still choosing the false Jesus' way the one who wants revolution, the one who wants overthrow of our oppressors. But now we're so haunted by that that we can't, we're, we're suspicious of everything that has institutional staying power. You know, math is a problem now. You like math. Yeah. Math is, is, is structurally oppressive. We're, we're worried about math. We're also worried about Shakespeare. Shakespeare needs to be taken out of the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a real vicious movement towards this and it will get stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah. He shouldn't have wrote Romeo and Juliet, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Where does this, you know, like you say, where does this end? That's the question of our time. Where does this go? Because the right wants to just say, well, you like Shakespeare, you hate Shakespeare. I love him now. It's the greatest thing of all time. And it's like, okay, you can like it, but that's not really going to solve the problem. You're just mimetically continuing the cycle. You hate it? I love it. That's still imitation. And, and it doesn't the, break the problem. And know? that's the problem is, by and large, identity politics used to be a phenomenon on the left. Right. Now it has become the, the, the political currency in the United States of, 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 of both sides. 
and, and, and the idea of a, of a riot to get your way was something that was a little bit more seen on the revolutionary left. And now with that capital thing and other things, now the right's imitating that too. So, the, and that's another thing Gerard talks about is this merging of the self, you know, these merging of two rivals. The more they compete, the more they look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mimetic double. But in the moment, when you're in that conflict, you look farther apart than ever, you know? And that's why it's so hard for us to break through that conversation and say, you know, take one of those rivals aside and say, hey, look, you're looking exactly the same. And they're like, are you kidding me? There's a mile of difference between me and what those dirty, deplorable, racist supremacists, and they'd say, are you kidding me? Those globalists selling us out? Selling out our country? You know? Hypocrites? You know, and so they can't even see. But at the, but the big picture, that big God's eye, eye eagle's eye, you can kind of see they look kind of the same. One's burning the city, the other one's attacking the capital. You know what I mean? One's saying, hey, my identity is what defines me. The other one's saying, well, my identity is what defines me, and, my, and I'm oppressed. And they say, well, no, I'm oppressed. But nobody wants to stop and say, hey, you know what? We're both getting oppressed by this, right? We're all getting oppressed. Let's stop fighting over Who's got more oppression points? But that's the one thing we can't seem to do as a society. Because we feel like if we if we drop that guard, if we drop our guard, we're gonna get devoured, you know? Because Jesus was killed. You know, Jesus said, hey, follow me, but he gave us the worst pitch in history. He said, take up your cross and follow me. And everybody's like, ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> You're not really serious, right? Take up your cross and follow me. That's that's my best marketing pitch I can give you. you know, I got nails through my hands. I got nails through my legs. You know, that's why we're always, you know, bringing the sacred, right? We're always trying to bottle up Jesus into an object because we really don't want to let that become the subject of our life. Right. You know? Of, of Wait a second. You're not serious. I'm not literally going to take up my cross. That's a suicide pact. That's what everybody says. When I, you know what I mean? When I tell people, hey, should we follow Jesus? They're like, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't bring Jesus into politics. You don't bring Jesus into the midst of this. That's going to get you killed. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but it could be. Because there's always a risk you could get killed by the mob when you try to get in the middle of a, of a raging mob, right? Well, and one of the problems with, with the world we find ourselves in, identity politics reigning supreme, um, each side looks at the other and says, says that, that the differences are irreconcilable. Right. That, that the other side is 100% evil. Right. And, the, and, the, and, and, both sides will, and, and both sides will ask the question, is it even possible for us to, to build a bridge together? Is it possible for us to, to ever sit down and, and put our disagreements aside? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes both sides, will, both sides will say that the other side's mind is completely toxic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is, and the the problem with that is, is that if you bring Jesus into it, what Jesus says is, all of our minds are toxic, mm -hmm. with exception with the exception of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So it's a humility that we yeah. just don't want to get to, because again, I think we're in this fight or flight mode, where we feel backed up into a corner. Everybody does, and and all their little cliques and tribes. And it's like, we don't have time to make peace because they're gonna, our, our opponents are going to devour us. And there's a kind of truth to that, you know? Because, but Jesus isn't saying to flinch, you know? Right. He doesn't say to flinch because the flinching motion will make you get devoured. Cow telling to the mob will get you devoured, you know? And he's not saying, you know, hey, yeah, just, you know, sweet talk him and be nice because you'll survive. That's what, you know, that's not the way of Jesus. You know, Jesus looks down when the crowd is wanting to stone the adulterous woman, you know, and he, he averts his gaze, as Gerard would suggest, to, to pre prevent them from projecting their hatred into the eyes they see in him. This is an Aikido move. He's trying to deflect and save this woman's life. And he knows that if he stands and looks them toe to toe and says, do not kill this woman, that that is going to create a mimetic reciprocal, oh, yes, we will kill him, and you're a devil, because they're going to project their own hatred into his eyes, because the eyes are the windows to the soul. Mm -hmm. And when a tribe has lost its mind, and when you've lost your mind in a possession of a crowd, yeah. you're like, I'm going to do it now because you told me I could. <laughs> right, 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 and so weird. Jesus is like, I'm going to take a <laughs> like small a child, man. So Jesus yeah. is a social Aikido genius, so he takes the posture, he gets low, so as to not get them bowling up on him. And he starts doodling around, gets small posture, 
He says, "Who he is without sin, cast the first stone. So he ninja flips their whole thing, and they're all thinking about, well, who is going to cast the first stone? Is it Bob? I know Bob's kind of, kind of a dirty dude. This guy's over here like, Tim, hey, Tim, I saw you last weekend during Shabbat. Okay, yeah, you're going to do it? Okay. You know, and now all of a sudden they're like, yeah, yeah, but about me? Yeah, I got, I got a stone in my hand. And, and he de totally deflects the collective tribe, the identity politics of we're pure, she's impure, she's got to go, and he breaks it into persons breaks that into person. It's like there's a frequency of we are one, we are yeah. one, and he goes, it's scrambles probably, that frequency. You know, like, oh, you know what, man? It was probably I'm a human the, now. It you was know? probably the fact that all them dudes probably were with her yeah. with some Jose Cuervo in their hand, yeah. you know what I'm saying, th th that last weekend. Yeah, yeah. And he, and, you know what I'm saying? So, you her, know. Her bad deeds were their bad deeds. <laughs> exactly, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, he but saves what? that life by bringing them back to their personal responsibility for the action of violence that they're that they're lost in a sea of sameness. Because if everybody's throwing fifty stones, you can always say, "Yeah, I don't even know if my stone hit her. I think she was already dead. I think my stone hit the ground." You know what I mean? Because that's what crowds do, right? I was at the camp. <laughs> the people say, I, I, "I didn't do it." Yeah, that's like people saying these people running into the Capitol. Well, I was just there to take photos. Oh, you don't man. know who's who. You don't know. You don't know who's doing what. Right. I got a mask on. That guy had a mask on. That guy's in Tifa. This guy's a <laughs> Nazi. This guy's a, uh, you know, save the right. rainforest. Did, did we gotta throw, save the whale guy did here. You throw a punch and get caught on camera. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. And we're, we're. I mean, this year it's so hard to talk about Gerard because we are swimming in Gerard's playbook. This, you know, his ocean. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. so many sacrifices. We got everybody wearing masks and yelling at everybody and, and you know, anonymity and all this stuff. You know, and it's just kind of hard. It's like it's like drinking from a fire hose trying to like stop the news cycle. Like, all right, let me show you what's going on here. Let me show you what's happening here. Because it's like he wrote the play here, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it's it's one of those things that we, we need to be able to kindle a conversation around a fire with people who are at war with each other. And make peace. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. It doesn't mean we have to say you're right half and you're right half. You know, you got to be a haphazard kind of like a, you know what I mean, like a like a Mickey Mouse piece. Like let's all agree, you know, just to kind of not, you know, kind of smoothing out the surfaces instead of you have to be able to hash it out. But we've got to be able to bring peace into the conversation here. Yeah. You know. And not try to act like we're above the fray, moderate, centrist. You know, that there's a, there's a false way of doing that piece. Oh, you know, I don't have any particular issues here. I'm just going to sort all you tribal, you know, folks out. No, no, no. We're all in it. We're all, we've all got it. And that's kind of the point of Jesus, right? Is to recognize that's why he's talking to people who are his own people who are oppressed. And he's saying, you got to work on yourself. That's kind of a, that's a cold water on people, you know? Mm -hmm. People who are losing their jobs, people who are in our time, they're losing their careers, losing their family identity, losing their, you know, breaking marriages apart. All this stuff's falling apart. And, and Jesus, in that conversation of our time, he's like, you got to worry about what you're going to do. Though. You know what I mean? And they're like, I don't want to hear that right now. You know, Rome's running my show. You know, Rome's occupying us. Our leaders are selling us out. And you're telling us we got to worry about how we respond to that. <laughs> yeah. You're blaming the victim is the feeling. And that's why people don't want to hear the Jesus message because Jesus, he, he reconciles the oppressor and the oppressed together. And people are like, we do not have time for that. The left is oppressing us, the globalists are oppressing us, or patriarchy is oppressing us. And every one of their stories, you can find truth. They've all got bits of truth here, you know? You're like, yeah, that's true, that is oppressive, the way men did that to women, or the way this identity group would, would structurally oppress another. And there and those things don't go away overnight, you know? Yeah. And, that, and that's something that, you know, one of the things, one of the mistakes of the right reaction, the right wing reaction to the left overreach of smothering everything into this vindictive equity thing is that the right overreach reaction to that is everything's fine. That was in the past. Women were treated that in the past, nothing to see here, you know? African Americans were treated that way, but that's in the past. We're fine. I didn't have, no, and, and we don't talk about the collective memories, the collective 
how would you say residual, the, 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 the afterglow of these things that continue generationally, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. And there has to be a way to redeem that, you know? How do you redeem that conversation? Honestly. Don't you think that a lot of it is us coming to grips with, every one of us, um, coming to grips with and understanding that everything that we, that we hate in, 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 in our enemy is really deep seated inside of us. That every bit that the, that let, let's say somebody that hates, that hates the oppression of the patriarchy, um, that that's, that, 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 that capacity, possibly even that act of oppression is something they're doing in their own life against someone else. They may not even be aware of it. Yeah. And, and it's very easy to, to hate that thing when you see it in someone else. Right. Um, but it's very hard, it's much harder to deal with it in your own life yeah. and with yourself. Yeah. Like when you see what's happening with Cuomo, right? Is that, when you hear all these news stories about Governor Cuomo and all this stuff coming out, his sins are coming out. How does that make you feel when you hear that? Well, well and it, it's really, it's really interesting. What, what, you've got Cuomo and then you've got Ted Cruz. Right, right, right at the same time. Yeah, 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 you've got both at the same time. So, so for- the Tale for, of two hypocrites. Yeah, so, so for somebody that's yeah. on the right wing, yeah. They're going to look at somebody like Andrew Cuomo and they're going to say he's a liar. He is an oppressor. He he is he he's all these horrible things, mm -hmm. right? And then someone on the left is going to look at Ted Cruz and they're going to say he has abandoned his his place in the world. He shirked his responsibilities. He took off to Cancun during yeah, the ice Yeah, yeah, he he just goes off to Cancun. He's privileged. You know, so so but but the thing is is that both sides are going to look at their at, at their opposite at the scapegoat, mm -hmm. and they're they're going to impugn all all of their hatred onto that person. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that those are probably things that they hate about themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that they're not dealing with yeah. themselves. Yeah, uh, it's that take that mm -hmm. take the beam out of your own mm -hmm. eye. You know what I'm saying? It, it just goes right. And you think that kind of might have something to do with the way you know the targets for scapegoats, unfortunately, through history, have been the weak. And, yeah. and the folks who are disabled. Yeah. And it's like the manifestation of a physical disability in a community, they feel like, well, that's evoking mm -hmm. something about what they're disabled in, in, in terms yeah. of their own weaknesses and their own frailties and their own uh, feelings of, of, of not being able to perform in certain ways that they want to be able to perform. And so they have to expel their wrath onto, well, you're, you know, you're, you're a monster because you're disabled or disfigured or something, or you have an illness. God's, the gods hate you because you're worried that they might hate you because of what you do and what you are, are failing at yeah. and what your cough is. You know, you're coughing into, you know, you cough quietly after you went after the, the witch causing all the plague. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I don't want to be accused next. You know, my friend Monica Paulus from Papua New Guinea, they tried to burn her at the stake. Uh, because they accused her of being a witch. Mm. And they have this concept called jealous, that this, this deep-seated jealousy that burns and it, it can get out of control and it's often targeted towards women. Mm. And oftentimes it's based upon wanting to have access to property that they have or, or, or possessions that they have. That women have or? Or it could be men too, but oftentimes yeah. it, 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 the, 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 the burnings of witches happens towards women. Oh, okay. in, the, in, yeah, her, yeah. in her culture. Right, right. So they're so, envious. Yeah, envy. Yeah. And so they're jealous of something they have. And this, a lot of this was stoked by, you know, Western capital, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. markets coming into their, into the, into the, you know, the, into their community. Mm -hmm. And they could, people accumulate wealth and technology fast. Mm -hmm. And that could incite, you know, a lot of, a lot of jealousy, a lot of deep-seated envy. And, and so she said that, you know, when they, when they want to take you out, it can be the littlest thing that can can start it. You know, it could be a yawn. You yawn wrong. Oh, I saw a, a witch. That's a witch because you yawn wrong. You had a spell. You had a, a, a spirit coming out of you, and you were trying to cover it up. You know, and they would use that literally as the occasion Great. to start Great. a vicious burning of a woman alive. This is happening in our time. Right. This is not happening a thousand years ago. Right. But in some sense, we're doing this to ourselves in a more indirect way today, yeah. you know, in the West. It's like what it's like what Surat was talking about when a lot of, a lot of Indian scholars and stuff will, will blame will blame Great Britain for every ill, you know, that 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 is 
within within you know Indian society because they'll say they they are the ones that came up with the caste system, right? Um, and that's a way to kind of like deflect, you know, and, and and project all the things that are wrong with India onto, you know, the colonial masters, right? And, and, I, and I think I think this goes I think this goes I think this goes the same way for like colonial Africa, right? Like, well, everything that happened in Africa is because of the Europeans, right? And not reflecting on the fact that like African kingdoms were at at odds with each other and sold each other's you know children and bought women and, and sons into slavery right because they were trying to claim you know um, you know the resources so it's like you know I always give the example of like the um you know like the akan peoples versus the people in dahomey you know two 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 rivals with each other you know what i mean it's like the priests and the gods are telling me it is right to enslave those people and sell them to white people because we are supposed to have control over you know this area or the or these resources you know what i mean so it, but Today's narrative, it's, well, Europeans came in, you know, the French came in and the British came in, the Dutch came in, the Portuguese came in, and that's when, you know, we got corrupted. We were, we were corrupted once they, once they came in, right? It's like, they, they, you know, the idea, like, we really want to have, like, the white man's burden, you know what I mean? Like, you, you have to deal with this and be confronted with it, and, like, you can't put any blame on anyone else, right? Because you, you have done more to destroy the world than, than than anybody else like what 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 african kingdoms and and indian kingdoms did was that was on a small scale right but what europeans did was 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 so global mm -hmm. that you know it, it's there's no comparison to it or mm -hmm. something like that your you know sin I mean? is greater than the other right sin. right now because of the scale and, and yeah extent right now now the, the only <laughs> i think for me the only the only way that i would I would accept that in some ways and I don't I don't, I don't want to say accept I want to say it in a way that like I would say Christianity was so deeply ingrained in the European culture that they knew to do better and because they because African nations didn't know that and the and these in these Indian kingdoms and, 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 and you know in Asia didn't know that right in the Americas people in the Americas didn't know that I always have the perception that medieval Europeans knowing that these people were ignorant of the gospel used that to their advantage you know how oh. because it, because it's like well if they don't know about forgiveness and love and, and, and all of that and they're doing this stuff to each other you know, they're, they're enslaving each other, they're battling with each other, they're fighting with each other. Why would we tell them about the gospel and about peace and love? When we can make a killing off When of we this. can make a, yeah. That's the only way that I would, like. Because they were, they were, instead of recognizing that some of the technological advances they had had were a, an effect of the gospel, yeah. they were trying to make it all about our superiority. Yeah, yeah, our, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our yeah. Distinct, you know, they're trying to take credit <laughs> for, for, for for advantages that they did not have right to claim right. credit for. Right? right, 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 yeah. They didn't have the mm -hmm. idea of a gift from God for the things that they had had that, right. that gave them that yeah. that technological advantage or something in yeah. that moment, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's I mean, you know, yeah. Might be a little far-fetched, but that's, I don't well, know. Well, no, no I, I, I think that's a very interesting point. And if you look, I, I think if you look at, um, people like Cortez and Pizarro, in particular, and you know, and th th there were many other Europeans that went to, that went all over the world to Africa and places, and and no no doubt that there were Europeans that showed up mm -hmm. and exploited the localities and treated the people terribly. Um, it's interesting because if you look at at what those Europeans um, said about those people, they they justified their exploitation by saying that these people were like the the spawn of the devil. Or that, or that these people were were animals, or, or or that these people were somehow 
um, less than human and and didn't even have any redeemable qualities that somehow they were um, uh, outside of the purview of, of the of the Christian uh, mm. story that's unfold that that was uh, that's unfolding and uh, and I think they had to do that yeah. in the light of the gospel right. in order to justify yeah. the exploitation yeah, to yeah. show their conscience right. of those people yes yeah. so they were doing the same thing that they were judging the them for doing right. right right oh look they're savages dehumanizing each other so we'll dehumanize them so we can keep doing it too right so why would God give this kind of revelation if humans can't handle it? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you, you get one, you get this story that says, hey, stop killing each other, stop sacrificing each other to have peace. Mm -hmm. And that story spreads like a viral and a virus contagion kind of slowly and it falls apart and slowly and fits and starts. It kind of causes people to say, hey, uh, maybe we should stop burning witches to mm -hmm. stop the plague and maybe we should examine that growth on that dead body over there and see if maybe something on that nose if we could look at it closer with a piece of glass might give us some insight into how to stop this plague yeah. without going to Martha again because she's dead <laughs> and we got a couple other people that look like witches but after they're gone I don't know who else to blame so yeah. it's kind of like you have that introspective moment where that that blind you know it's that it's the Jesus Aikido being played out in history mm -hmm. You know, the who will cast the first stone thing is haunting cultures that are baked in that. Mm -hmm. As much as they shield it and try to objectify Jesus and make him an object that they can put in their pocket and, and, and try to protect that revelation, it still hits them in their conscience slowly, right? Mm -hmm. And yet that, that, that story gives people the insight to be able to develop scientific technologies that does give them a comparative advantage against other people who don't have that mm -hmm biblical tradition story mm -hmm. and yet for some reason humanity can't seem to handle that <laughs> they end up colonizing everybody or exploiting what they instead of instead of cashing that in for mercy they cash it in for profit you know they cash in right. that that technological insight or that uh, that comparative advantage in that moment yeah so why would God give us something with su you know it's like giving you a toy and then we were over there shooting you know what I mean right. giving kids a gun and they're yeah. but it's, it's, it's like why are you doing this it's, you know? it's like it's like what Jesus says it's like the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak you know what I mean like right. like I I just can't get over the fact that I could get something out of this and live you know sit up in a cabana and sick on coconut juice you know what I'm saying like why why would I why would I give that up in order to be you know what I mean? And and that's one thing I think a lot of people, we always think like, oh, well, I wouldn't be like that. You know, I, I would love my neighbor and I'd be nice and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, okay. So, you know, get the money and let's see how you behave. Right. Like, I'm not, I'm not, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm not going to lie and sit here and be like, yeah, I'd be just, you know, take it all to the Lord. And like, you know what I'm saying? All my money's going to the church. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I'm going to give 10% of my, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know about that, man. I don't know about that. That'd be a hard, be a hard bargain. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, you, you really have to, you, you really have to struggle. You know what I'm saying? You really have to work on that. And you have to, that's, that's, um, it's a self-sacrifice. You know what I mean? But Christianity has, has so baked into our storytelling and our ethics and the movies I always point to that movie that one of those latest Jurassic Park movies Jurassic World or something where the end the the climax is they've got to unleash these these GMO dinosaurs into the into the human population or exterminate them all they're and they're raptors. so self-sacrificial yeah. they're so christian like i'll take the plank out of my own eye here they're, they're like all right guys yeah we're not we're not going to euthanize you we're not right. doing that that's cruel and that's hateful right. it's not your fault that we brought you guys back as GMO dinosaurs. <laughs> You're beautiful animals. You have a lot of hope. Open the gates and let them things run, run, <laughs> run wild in the suburbs. And that's how the movie ends. That's so self-sacrificial. The ancient mythology, you were tearing up Grendel. <laughs> tearing that Grendel up. Bam, 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 you know? You didn't do no, hey, let's let Grendel out. Grendel's a misunderstood GMO dinosaur. You know what I mean? You're like, no. Grendel's got to go. <laughs> Grendel's got some teeth. <laughs> got Get Beowulf to whoop up on some Grendel. Tear his yeah. tail apart. Yeah. And we don't. And we're so Christianized that we're like, oh my goodness, we cannot sacrifice. You know, right. much less sacrifice a chicken. We can't sacrifice a T Rex. <laughs> the baby arms are not their part, right? Yeah. yeah. That thing's got teeth on it. Don't worry, it's not his fault. Let him use his teeth. 
the way he needs to use his teeth. So we're so sacred in our treatment for <laughs> those who would be candidates for sacrifice. We don't want to slay the dragon. We're going <laughs> to unleash the dragon in our own neighborhood. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. So we can go get along with it. <laughs> don't you think that in that there's a presumption of innocence? That if you take that those GMO dinosaurs, that 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 there's a presumption of innocence there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and and that and that 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 it's that it's that <laughs> overarching statement of Christ. Mm -hmm. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Right. Kill the first dino. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. But but it, it, it's really interesting though, that 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 makes sense to to, to our society that right. that uh, that people will, will say oh that makes sense that the the, the innocent gmo dinosaurs mm -hmm. that it makes sense for them to be released because yeah. we, we wouldn't want to cause them harm because they're innocent right. but on the other hand many of them will wish ill will mm -hmm. upon their political enemies right. but you know because it's that plank thing again it's like i'm a human so i'm so obsessed with the plank in my eye as a human mm -hmm. that i will give i will give submit you know su i will submit and give deference to the other in this case it's an animal mm -hmm. you see what i mean yeah. that's why you get these people raging on youtube comments about someone catching a fish and you'll see them like i hope you die for catching that fish <laughs> it's like it's a fish bro they're eating you're not you're not raging in the comments about a, a spider you know grabbing a hold of a of an animal and injecting it you know it's venom and it's slow death and decay they're not like stop it spider you're right you know you oppressive you know awful you know subjugator it's like no but they'll do it to their human because it feels like it's them, right? In relationship, you know, like when you see the, the, the human catching the fish, it's like, that's me, that's me, that's team human. Mm -hmm. And look how they're picking on that poor little fish wiggling around. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, you're like, yeah, I can see the pain of the little fish. You kind of get into it too. You're like, yeah, yeah. You, don't, you shouldn't wish that the fishermen die, but you know what I mean? But like, I can kind of see your point of fish, you know, you start to empathize with the weak. Yeah. That's a Christ, that's a that's that Judeo Christian inheritance of of taking care of the outsider, including the little guppy. You know, the guppy, make room for the guppy. <laughs> but but the point is if we make room for the guppy with force, you're sacrificing the fishermen just to save the guppy. Right. You know? That's the same thing. That's where we're at today. You know what I mean? It's like and and so it's kind of like how do we how do we get into this? We can see this train wreck happening. Gerard and Young and all these folks give us some some toolkit to kind of see how it's happening, but yet we're still in this void where we don't know what happens next. We're not exactly sure how to how to avoid this train track, this this train wreck, this slow motion train wreck that's getting a little faster. You know, it seems like the solution would be for us to figure out how to universally make everyone aware of um, or or to to universally. For, for people to universally become more conscious of the fact that that none of us are without sin. Because then it would become more difficult for us to cast that stone. No matter, no matter if it's against s some privileged person at the top of the patriarchy yeah. or some privileged person at the top of some matriarchy. Yeah. You know, um, that, that if we are, if we really come to terms with the fact that that we are not without sin, then it'll be very difficult for us to cast that stone. But see, what the, the, the critical theory type woke left would say to that is that you're still giving, you're enabling the oppressor to get away with it. That's their problem with that. That's why they can't let go of that for them, you know? You're enabling the oppressor, and the right would say something simple. You're enabling the oppressor to get away with hurting and abusing and whatever they feel, because it's again about the feeling Words are violence, remember that. Words are violence in this new postmodern world. Because words are the new vestige of myth. Used to be you would tell a story. Odin, you know, demands this and this is why we gotta mm -hmm. kill you. And now it's like these words are where we contain violence and, and, and we use them as weapons now. And it's where like, the, way, the way you're talking right now is making me feel very unsafe, <laughs> okay? And it's like, all I said was math is okay. I said <laughs> math is okay. I'm triggered. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, no, the way you're talking about Shakespeare right now really, really makes me feel like I'm not in a safe space, okay? And it's like, these are words, okay? This is Shakespeare's words, to be or not to be. And it's like, they're hearing to kill or not to kill you. And there, there's this viciousness about words and language and, and you know what I mean? And there's this, de this desire to deconstruct it all mm -hmm. and then rearrange the stack to give vengeance points back to the people who 
Shakespeare was disgusting to, you know, who he was a bigot to or something, to make it fair. Don't laud Shakespeare because he was a sinner. And he wrote too well. And he only wrote too well because he must have been, you know, he had some kind of conspiracy that he was helping him out, that he was benefiting from, some kind of, you know, situation in the hierarchy. But that's kind of where, you know, we had to be able to come into that conversation and say, okay, it's okay to have a concern for justice. That's the problem I don't like with some, you know, Christian circles and is that they want to say, no, 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 there's no justice issue. We just need to work on, you know, kind of keeping things the way they used to be and rolling it back or something, double down back there. It's like, no, there is some justice stuff that needs to happen, some severe, you know, justice conversations. But how that looks is very important. And that's yeah. one of the and and that's one of the reasons that that uh, institutions are so important in society, right? Because yeah. if if there's a community, if there's if there's some community institution, it might be a local government, it might be a local church, it might be a local civic organization, but a bowling club, right? Yeah, a, a, a bowling club, po yeah, possibly and, Lions Club or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and and with that with that local. What that little community or uh, institution would do is it would help us to mitigate our differences, right? And also, too, the more opportunity we have to coexist together and be face to face, the more we come to realize, even though I, even though we we disagree quite a bit, and and I may even believe, or one person may believe another person to be the the to be evil incarnate, if they have to face one another, to if they have to actually face one another. Then, um, then, then they start to to see the the common humanity in 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 in, uh, in the other person. Right, right. It's it's about letting people see their neighbor, letting the crowd see the woman as themselves. Right. I'm not going to stone this woman because, I mean, I have sin too. Right. Yeah. He is without sin cast the first stone. The left wants to stone Jesus for telling the woman go and sin no more. The right wants to stone the woman because she's impure and causing the neighborhood to go down the drain, you know? Yeah. As I tell people, it's like, they, you know, the right wants to have be tougher on crime. So we're going to have a big giant nanny state that gives you three square meals a day, government health care, a roof over your head, a government job. You know what I mean? That's right. real tough on crime, isn't it? Yeah, you're yeah. going to extend the life sentence to a double life sentence for yeah. a drug? Okay, you're, you're real tough. Give yeah, them they, a little college up, education. I yeah. mean, it's, it's a cruel thing, but it's still not very macho the way they try to act like yeah let's yeah. get tough on crime and lock them up longer you yeah. know they do what the left does even, yeah. but just even worse right you know it's like you're getting confined for real you right. know what i mean it's not just to the projects it's yeah. like two but, they, but that's not tough <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's abusive but it's not it's not a tough way of dealing with something you know tough love is a family member slapping you say get your shit together because you're addicted to something that's killing you that's tough love but this kind of incarceral state that we have where it's like, you know, we're going to have a sterile bureaucracy with no skin in the game. You know what I mean? Just kind of bureaucratically shuffle you as a number into a giant nanny state, you know, machine as prison labor and all this. That's not tough love. That's not love. There's no relationship there. That's just just a mechanistic, like you were saying before, the the old way of the, the World War One type era, that whole 20th century of mechanically chopping, cutting, separating, expelling, and not having any kind of focus on the human there. That's being at the equation, of, right? At the yeah, yeah, re yeah uh, the, the, the epitome of science and rationality turned against humanity. Yeah. Right? Right. Right. Fascinating. Shannon, what's the answer? Uh, I think it's uh, what Jesus says in the scriptures. Uh, love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Right? And the other one is, is like it, is unto it. Right. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's just that simple, huh? It's, it's not simple, you know, but it's a simple prescription. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, a, it's like an equation simple equation that explains explains everything you know what I mean it's like a simple answer to a, a huge problem you know what I mean
Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to scandalize them or oppress them right. or vilify them yeah. or dehumanize them right. or surveil them or cage them. Yeah. Because you see, you <laughs> see, things you wouldn't want to be caged for. Yeah. Because you see, you see them in you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know. You know. They they bear the image of God. You know they they are the image. Of, they're made in the image of God. What you want to what you want to see about that person is not what you want to see about that person is not God. You know what you want to see about that person is not a person. What you want to see about that person is that person is evil. That person is mean. That person is violent. That person is you know ignorant. Bigoted. Ignorant. That person is you know a whore. Whatever you want to say, like they ain't. The child of God, you know what I mean, and they ain't made in the image of God, and they ain't—they're not like me, because I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, I don't—I don't bear any of those characters. Like, I don't have any of those characteristics, mm -hmm. right? And and we have, you know, we all have a hard time with that. You know what I'm saying? Like, just me saying, just me saying it. It's like I know that's not how I think about people when I look at them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. You yeah. know. You look in the mirror and you see Bao or what? Medusa? Who do you see in the mirror? <laughs> Who do you see in the mirror? I see imperfection. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to see that and to own it. Because when we only see the, when we only see and embrace the perfect parts of, of ourselves, that makes us blind, mm -hmm. and it makes us, it makes us act carelessly, and it makes us become tools of, of uh, forces that can cause harm to others. All right. Gerard said that that's what, kind of the point of being Christian is to realize that you scapegoat too. Because you don't, yeah. you never believe that the person that you're laying all your indignation against, because anger feels good, it makes you feel like you're right yeah. to be in, you know, righteous indignation. You know, never want to believe that, like you were saying earlier, that you're maybe you're, you're indignant. That maybe they have harmed you, but also there's also an element that's often about what they remind you about what you're capable of or what you do tend to do yourself in a different way, mm -hmm. right? They're oppressive, but you oppress. They're greedy, but you're greedy. They're ridiculous the way they treat their coworkers or their employees, but you you kind of kind of wish you could do too if you could get away with it, you know. And the, and that that bothers people. And that's the that's what it means to repent. That's that idea of repentance, which is the most like even if I say that word, I feel like I'm saying a cuss word, you know, because the way the people think of that word, like what did you just do? You just fouled up the room with that word because that's how far we've come away from that, right? Yeah. We're so caught up in envy that the last thing on our mind is repentance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we are really convinced that that person has things because they're, they're lucky and they don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. And I could do so much better if I had the things they have. Mm -hmm. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sit in a cabana and sip on a coconut, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, with my feet propped up on exactly. oppression. I wouldn't do that. I'd do it right. Yeah, do it the right way. Well, hopefully we'll do it the right way. Because this is, this is a dark time in different ways, but it's also a hopeful time for me too. Because there's something about becoming in the likeness of Christ that I think as we do that, as we become more like Christ as a human species, and you might say, David, we're nowhere near that, but, but just if we're on a process, if we're in a direction towards that, if history is going somewhere, that it seems like the more closer we get to that, the more all of our imperfections are gonna haunt us. We used to be worried about, hey, you just genocided my tribe, and now we're worried about brands and logos and language and math, you know? So we, we, we've come some way, you know? I always like to illustrate how the Colosseums 
versus the NFL football. In the Coliseum times, they weren't worried about gladiators getting concussions. Today, we're worried about how do we make those pads and rules differently so that football players don't get concussions. In the gladiator times of Rome, they weren't concerned about how the gladiators treated their girlfriends. That's a big scandal that has plagued the NFL is how do we deal with domestic abuse coming up as an epidemic in some cases. In the gladiator days, they weren't worried about, hey, let's all stand in solidarity or kneel or whatever about what the Roman emperor did in his oppression to a person, you know, with the execution of Roman law. That wasn't a thing. When the Roman emperors came in, you all stood in unity and reverence or whatever it is that you would use to, de to, de to defer to that unity. And that's the work of Jesus. Jesus did that in history. <laughs> Jesus made those cushions and those football helmets a little thicker than they may have used to be. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we are haunted by what we're doing. So much so that we can't even do simulated violence anymore without being really concerned about the ugliness of what we're going along with. And let's hope that we can use that haunting to really, to really change things and have a balance between the feelings and the logic and the planning and the, and the and let's reconcile these things together, you know, to redeem both sides. So the question is, can humanity, you know, pass that test, so to speak? You know, can we, can we actually figure that out? Or are we just going to spiral off into are, are fiery we, blaze here? Yeah. You know? Is it going to be continuous, cyclical? spring, winter, Baal cycle, you know, Persephone going down to Hades, going back up to her mother, Demeter, you know. It's I, like all the politicians that we elect, every time they win, they say, I just want unity. Yeah. Just want unity, guys. Just want unity. Let's all unify. But what yeah. they really mean by unity is I just want you all to fall in line yeah. and just obey me. Yeah. And God doesn't do that, right? He says, I'm going to bring peace, but not as the world gives it. Peace and unity, those kind of go hand in hand, you know? The peace I'm bringing is going to cut through the fake unity like a sword. And it's going to cut families against each other. Because it's going to haunt us so much that we're not going to be able to get along with the traditional institutional way of doing things. Like We're going to deconstruct so much of what we are and who we are because we're haunted by that sword that Jesus has brought into the humanity cutting through our false sense of peace and unity. And so we see through that, these false calls of unity. Hey guys, I just won. I just want us all to unify. Just let's unify. But you're a terrorist. <laughs> and we're going to surveil you. We're going to have a war on terror here at home. Yeah. Oh, but we're going to unify. Yeah. But we're not going to wish any of your people who die any well wishes. Right. Might, might gloat a little bit. But yeah. we're going to unify. Yeah. But you got to submit. God does the opposite, you know. He submits to us, our unity, our unity. Yeah. He submits to our unity machine yeah. by being the scapegoat. To, to break, to break out to of break. that, to break out of that cycle. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like that whole thing of unity, it to me sounds like cyclical time. You know what I mean? Like we want things to go back the way they used to be, like some normalcy, which is let's get a, let's get a spring, spring, you know, fall, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, you know, let's get that, let's get that summer solstice, you know, summer solstice, you know, equinox, whatever, going, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But God makes the rain fall on the just and the unjust. It's not about who you sacrifice that makes the rain fall, you know? I'm glad we did this. We need some s'mores. Yeah.